The Subcommittee on National Security, Illicit Finance, and International Financial Institutions will come to order. This hearing is entitled, Held for Ransom, How Ransomware Endangers Our Financial System. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. I'd like to begin by thanking our witnesses for taking the time to be here today and thank you for your patience. I'm delighted to sit right next to my friend and colleague, Representative uh, Beatty, and additionally, I, and along with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, uh, wish Chairman Luckmeyer a speedy recovery. Today's hearing will provide policymakers with essential information on the anatomy of a ransomware attack. This is a topic we have not discussed holistically since the committee held a hearing on pandemic-related fraud almost four years ago. It is my hope that this hearing will provide a deeper understanding of the inner workings and long-term Im impacts of one of the leading cyber threats facing our nation today. Cyber attacks are carried out against organizations of all sizes and across every sector, including but not limited to financial services, gaming, healthcare, education, and state and local governments. We all hear about ransomware. It is a frequent news topic, but the scale of the issue can be lost in the noise. In 2023 alone, Ransomware attacks hit a record high with over a billion dollars extorted from victim organizations. The United States and the world is quickly learning that no matter how prepared a company may be or think they may be, the threat actors carrying out ransomware attacks have proven that no organization is safe from an attempt to infiltrate their systems. All the cybersecurity preparedness in the world cannot deter an employee from inadvertently providing identification credentials to a cyber criminal. As such, I look forward to learning more about how Congress can create incentives for proper cyber hygiene and training. We're pleased to welcome this panel of highly expert witnesses today who will provide insights and advice on ransomware attacks. Whether it pertains to cybersecurity resilience, incident response and data recovery efforts, notification processes, policy considerations, or following the money, these witnesses can shed a light on gaps in the efforts to keep America safe from cybercrime and suggest what Congress can do to address those gaps. Just over a month ago, two cities not far from my district, Oakley, and Pleasant Hill in California were the victims of a large ransomware attack, prompting the city of Oakley to declare a state of emergency. The technology divisions in these cities dropped everything to work with law enforcement to get incident response and recovery missions underway. Ransomware causes lasting real-world impacts for many across the country, as seen with this case in California. Similarly, in February, Changing Healthcare, which is one of the largest healthcare intermediaries between providers, patients, and payers, fell victim to what is being called, in quote, one of the worst ransomware attacks in years. The severity of this attack has forced the healthcare industry to reevaluate and reestablish entire facets of its supply chain efficiencies payment cycle management and cybersecurity readiness. I think it's fair to say that the ransomware threat is not going away anytime soon. As AI continues to grow more sophisticated, cyber criminals will harness these technological advancements to exploit the vulnerabilities of their victims. This weekend, Iran attacked Israel our greatest ally in the Middle East, with drones and missiles launched from Iranian soil. Since Hamas' barbaric attack against Israel on October 7th, the United States has been aware of Iran's role as a major funding source for the terrorist organization. Additionally, 
Iran has been facilitating aggressive cyber operations, ransomware included, against the United States and its allies. In February, the Justice Department announced that an Iranian national had been charged for a multi-year hacking campaign targeting U.S. defense contractors and private sector companies. It is clear our adversaries overseas will continue to employ cybercrime campaigns as means to hurt our nation. Congress must properly educate itself on the severity of this issue to better protect not only U.S. citizens and businesses, but U.S. national security interests as a whole. I'm grateful that the minority party has approached this hearing in a bipartisan fashion. This type of collaborative effort between committee staff and members on both sides of the aisle is exactly how we must approach a threat of this severity. We all must row in the same direction if we want to undercut the incredibly lucrative ransomware marketplace. So with that, thank you again to our witnesses for being here today, and I yield back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on National Security, Illicit Finance, and International Financial Institutions, the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Beatty, for four minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, and thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you also for your collaboration with me on so many financial issues and for holding this hearing today. And thank you to the witnesses who are here today to discuss necessary solution to ran ransomware attacks. Every year, small and medium-sized businesses, including financial institutions, are the victims of ransomware attacks in which bad actors introduce malicious software or malware into a victim's computer system to cut off access to critical data or systems until a ransom is paid. These attacks have the potential to bankrupt businesses, especially small businesses that already have fewer resources to play in place to protect themselves, and can also pose grave threats to our national security and the broader economy. Ransomware attacks, which represent approximately 10% of all cyber attacks, are sharply on the rise. In fact, the value of the United States ransomware incidents has increased nearly tenfold from $102 million in 2018 to $1.1 billion in 2023. Since 2020, there has been an 85% increase in the number of, ta of attacks, as well as a steady increase in the total ransom values received by ransomware attackers. In 2021 alone, the FBI received 3,729 ransom complaints. These figures, which don't even take into account the many victims who fought, failed to report their attacks, are staggering. Although companies have the option to purchase cybersecurity insurance to cover financial losses and businesses interruption costs stemming from ransomware attacks, these policies are becoming increasingly more expensive and harder to obtain. It's time that Congress is able to identify and have bipartisan solutions to ensure that businesses have adequate awareness and preparation to protect themselves and consumers. Committee Democrats have worked with the Biden administration to put forward real solutions and have proposed critical legislation to strengthen cybersecurity in the financial services industry. I am also incredibly grateful for the counter ransom efforts led by Treasury and its agencies, such as Financial Crime Enforcement Network, FinCEN, and the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC. Treasure Treasury and the Financial Stability Oversight Council have been working around the clock to identify and to address these attacks, including releasing a package of red flags that will help financial institutions to identify and trace payments to bad actors who commit these crimes. It's critical that we continue to empower and support these agencies to do what's necessary to prevent these attacks and to protect the United States businesses and consumers rather than undermining and attacking them at every turn. 
In addition, attacks against law enforcement agencies like the FBI and IRS criminal investigation hamper these agencies' ability to use all of their resources to protect businesses that are vulnerable to these attacks. And finally, we certainly won't remedy this issue by undercutting the very agencies at the center of the solutions. But I look forward to working with my Republican colleagues to address this growing national security threat. And thank you again to our witnesses. I look forward to hearing your testimony. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Beatty. Today, we welcome the testimonies of Jacqueline Burns Coven. Ms. Coven is head of cyber threat intelligence and at uh, chain analysis. Thank you for joining us. Daniel Sergail. Mr. Sergail is Senior Consulting Director at Unit 42 by Palo Alto Networks. Thank you. Megan Steifer. Ms. Steifer is Chief Strategy Officer at Institute for Security and Technology. Thank you. Kamba Innes Walden. Ms. Walden is President of Paladin Global Institute. I want to thank each of you for taking the time to be here. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. So without objection, each of your written statements will be made part of the record. And let me now recognize Ms. Coven uh, for five minutes of your oral remarks. Vice Chair Kim, Ranking Member Beatty, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today on this very important topic. My name is Jacqueline Burns Coven. I am the head of cyber threat intelligence of the blockchain data platform Chainalysis. In this role, I track ransomware operators and their enablers on the blockchain to empower policymakers and US government agencies with the data they need to investigate, attribute, and disrupt the ransomware supply chain. I also coordinate global ransomware research partnerships and joint initiatives. For the past 10 years, Chainalysis compliance and investigative solutions have been used by law enforcement, regulators, financial institutions, cryptocurrency businesses, and cybersecurity and incident response firms to investigate and disrupt threat actors engaged in ransomware and other illicit activities. Our data, investigative support, and software solutions have been involved in law enforcement activities resulting in the seizure of over $10 billion in assets held by illicit actors in numerous high-profile cybercrime cases including those involving some of the no most notorious ransomware actors. The subcommittee's focus on ransomware is well-timed, as 2023 proved to be a landmark year in terms of ransom payments. According to our data, ransomware gangs reached an unprecedented milestone, surpassing $1 billion in extorted cryptocurrency payments from victims, the highest ever annual amount observed. The upswing in total ransom payments in 2023 can likely be attributed to a major escalation in the frequency, scope, and volume of attacks. The professionalization of the criminal ecosystem has lowered the barriers to entry, making it easier than ever to deploy ransomware and give way to numerous ransomware strains. Although cryptocurrency is the predominant form of payment demanded in these attacks, cyber extortion dates back before the introduction of cryptocurrencies and the use of cryptocurrencies by ransomware actors provides a unique opportunity for those seeking to investigate and disrupt this activity. But it is a common misconception that these cryptocurrency transactions are completely anonymous and untraceable. Cryptocurrency transactions are inherently public, and the data from those transactions is preserved on a transparent, immutable ledger. At Chainalysis, we analyze the data from blockchains to map out the full network underpinning these campaigns, from the malware operators to the affiliates to the infrastructure providers. Our blockchain intelligence has supported a number of successful government operations involving the arrests, asset seizures, and ransomware takedowns. For example, in 2021, Chainalysis Solutions aided the FBI investigation of the infamous Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. The Department of Justice was able to seize $2.3 million worth of Bitcoin from the ransom received by Darkside, a Russian cybercrime group. Most recently, Chainalysis was leveraged as part of a multinational law enforcement operation to disrupt Lockbit, a Russian-based ransomware as a service responsible for some of the most brazen attacks on the US financial system last year, including attacks on ION, ICBC, and Equilend. In February, the US Department of Justice and the UK National Crime Agency announced that it had successfully seized servers, 200 cryptocurrency accounts, and public-facing websites, and obtained a decryptor keys for lockbit victims to recover their data without ever paying a ransom. 
These stunning takedowns show the cost incurred by threat actors choosing to engage in ransomware. Despite a record year in payment revenues and victim counts, our data suggests a nearly 50% decrease in the actual payments made compared to the year prior, a finding corroborated by incident response firms. This suggests that while it has become easier than ever to launch a ransomware attack, it has in some ways become more difficult to profit. This trend, while encouraging, is fragile, and we must maintain vigilance, enforce best security practices, and capacity building to empower government agencies and our allies. We need to continue to make it more difficult and risky for threat actors that do receive payment and demonstrate the ability to impose cost no matter where these ransomware actors reside around the world. We strongly believe that blockchain intelligence solutions like Chainalysis are key to continued success of operations like these and in fighting back on this growing form of cyber attack. To that end, we invite Congress's continued engagement on this topic as addressing this issue requires a whole of government approach in collaboration with the private sector. And we recommend that Congress ensure that law enforcement and other federal agencies have the resources necessary to comprehensively combat this issue. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Coven. I now recognize Mr. Sergile for five minutes to give your oral remarks. Vice Chairman Kim, ramp ranking members Waters and Beatty, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the ransomware threat landscape and the critical role incident responders play to help organizations recover from attacks. My name is Daniel Sergile, and I'm a senior consulting director of Unit 42 which is the Threat Intelligence and Incident Response Division of Palo Alto Networks. Prior to this role, I spent 25 years as a cybersecurity practitioner and 10 of those years as a Chief Information Security Officer. This includes the financial services industry. For those not familiar with Palo Alto Networks, we're an American headquarter company founded in 2005 and have since become the cybersecurity leader. We support the U.S. federal government, critical infrastructure operators, eight of the 10 largest U.S. banks, and a wide range of state and local partners. This means that we have deep and broad visibility into the cybersecurity threat landscape. We are committed to being good cyber citizens and national security partners with the federal government. The current cyber, uh, cyber threat landscape demands that we all work together. The scourge of ransomware has taken cybersecurity from once was seen as an IT issue to something with day-to-day -day relevance for many Americans that presents reputational, operational, and financial risk for organizations of all sizes. My written testimony includes some concern, concerning numbers and trends. We are seeing the ransomware threat grow and attackers use the sophisticated methods to extort money. Those increased harassment activities and multi, those include uh, increased harassment activity and multi extortion techniques. AI will further amplify the scale and speed of attacks and enable them to move to more quickly identify an organization's critical assets for exfiltration and extortion. An unfortunate reality of today's connected world is that many organizations lack the comprehensive visibility across their digital infrastructure. This includes computers, servers, mobile devices, and applications that are exposed to the internet. Simply put, our global attack surface looks porous and far too inviting to adversaries. This concern is often compounded by legacy IT which has been problematic in the financial services sector. This underscores the need for robust cyber defenses. Palo Alto Networks recommends organizations focus on the following actions to increase their resilience to ransomware and other attacks. One, maintain and test an incident response plan to prepare for and respond to cyber incidents, including ransomware tactics like extortion and harassment. Two, ensure complete visibility of attack surfaces to help identify and mitigate vulnerabilities before they can be exploited. Three, leverage the power of AI and automation to modernize cybersecurity operations and reduce the burden on overworked analysts. For too long, cyber defenders have been inundated with alerts to triage manually. AI can help flip that paradigm. Four, implement a zero trust network architecture to prevent or limit an, an accelerated I'm oh, sorry, limit an attacker from moving laterally across the network. And five, protect cloud infrastructure and applications. As cloud adoption accelerates, cloud security cannot be an afterthought. In a world where ransomware attacks impact our daily lives, including disruptions to banking, healthcare, and hospitality, prioritizing these five recommendations will make a real difference. 
My team at Palo Alto Network specializes in helping organizations to respond and recover during their time of need. Our mission goes beyond just recovery. We aim to elevate the cybersecurity posture so they come out stronger than they were before. This is, this is what makes this work so fulfilling for me personally. The spirit of partnership, the notion that we are all in this together must remain in our collective DNA. As a company, we are proud to participate in a number of forums like CISA's JCDC, the Ransomware Task Force, and FSISAC to share our situational awareness and understanding of the cyber threat landscape with key partners. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sergile. Now I recognize Ms. Steifert for five minutes of your oral statement. Vice Chairman Kim, Ranking Member Beatty, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to address how ransomware is impacting our financial system. My name is Megan Stiefel, and I serve as the Chief Strategy Officer at the Institute for Security and Technology, a nonprofit organization dedicated to outpacing emerging security risks by bridging the gaps between technologists and policymakers. I began working in nonprofits when I left government service, service almost 10 years ago, and I began my career in national security in 1999 when I joined the staff of the then House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. My commitment to our nation's national security has remained my highest professional priority, and I'm grateful to continue to support it in my role at IST. IST convened the Ransomware Task Force in 2020 in response to the growing threat posed by escalating attacks on our critical infrastructure. The Ransomware Task Force includes participants from industry, academia, civil society, and governments, including the United States, the UK, Canada, as well as multilateral organizations such as Europol. In total, 60 plus organizations have participated in the task force, including organizations represented by my fellow witnesses. In a span of four months in the early 2021, this coalition of stakeholders examined measures to help better deter, disrupt, and prepare and respond to ransomware. Three years ago this month, we published a report outlining key actions the task force identified, including a total of 48 recommendations, 12 of which related to financial services. Importantly, we call for closer regulation of the cryptocurrency sector due to its role in ransomware payments and resourcing, including through compliance with existing tools designed to reduce illicit payments, such as KYC, AML, and CFT rules and regulations. Ransomware attacks affect the financial services sector as they affect all of our critical infrastructure sectors, disrupting the provision of essential services and costing the industry millions. Ransomware in the financial services sector have a further relationship because cryptocurrency is the lifeblood of this criminal industry at this time. It enables attackers to get paid and move money around to their various partners and affiliates. Just days after we published our 2021 report, several high-profile ransomware attacks occurred, leading to the disruption of fuel and meat distribution, as well as the delivery of health care. While these were not the first attacks to target critical infrastructure, they formed a pivotal moment. Following these incidents, Congress and the Biden administration in a bipartisan manner recognized that ransomware posed an increasing national security threat and responded. We est you established incident response and recovery uh, reporting requirements, a cyber emergency response authorities provision, state and local grant programs, and the administration began leveraging sanctions together with law enforcement disruptions to combat the ransomware as a service business model. Much progress has been made and much of it aligns with the task force's recommendations and yet much work remains. Next week, we will publish our latest public progress report. Without creating too much of a spoiler, I can share that we have not seen further progress in 24 of the 48 recommendations. With respect to those 12 recommendations related to financial services recommendations, we assess that only four have seen significant progress. Unfortunately, the stakes keep getting higher. Today, as my fellow witnesses have identified, organizations can regularly confront not just encryption of their data, but also threats to release organizational and customer sensitive data. This risks privacy and intellectual property, together with increasing physical threats to their employees and their families. As a result, there remains an ongoing urgent need for concerted action by Congress, the administration, the American people, and our partners and allies in order to defeat ransomware. Cognizant of this urgency, I will focus on three ways to reduce the risk and impacts of ransomware to the financial services sector. First, financial sector resilience is essential to maintaining our roles as the world's financial leader. Congress and the administration should consider continue to explore how to better incentivize organizations across the ecosystem to develop and maintain their networks and products in the most secure and resilient manner possible. 
Second, in a corollary to resilience, we must ensure that government entities that underpin our role as the world's financial hub have adequate resources to investigate abuse of our services. In short, until we have a secure by design ecosystem in order to defeat ransomware, we must be able to follow the money. Timely and relevant information is essential to doing so, but in our experience, US government departments and agencies lack sufficient resources to adequately leverage this visibility to its fullest extent. This challenge is even further exacerbated outside the United States, where countries that harbor uh, ransomware actors or are otherwise members of the Financial Action Task Force have insufficient resources to fully fulfill their obligations. The United States can part and partner to close these gaps by helping bridge and scale legal and investigative capacity at home and abroad. Finally, the financial services sector has tremendous reach and can play an even greater role in helping raise our collective defenses. Congress and the administration should explore avenues for the government and financial services sector to partner to further drive adoption of known cybersecurity best practices. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Steifer. Let me now recognize Ms. Walden for five minutes to give your opening testimony. Good morning, Vice Chairman Kim, Ranking Member Beatty, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss ransomware attacks and illustrate why improved governance, better resilience, meaningful information sharing, and public-private partnerships are critical to combating ransomware. My name is Kemba Walden, and I am the president of Paladin Global Institute, a think tank committed to ensuring that secure critical infrastructure and the safety of people online remain core to sustainable technological innovation. I am also a co-chair of the Ransomware Task Force, which brings together experts across industries to combat ransomware. Prior to Paladin, I served as both the acting national cyber director and the principal deputy national cyber director. Before that, I stood up Microsoft's counter ransomware office in the digital crimes unit. Since my prior work at Microsoft and the stand up of the ransomware task force, we have seen new trends in ransomware attacks that highlight the importance of not only improved techniques for disruption, but also resilience and deterrence. Ransomware criminal syndicates will involve affiliates that specialize in obtaining access to an organization, reconnaissance of an organization's systems, identifying and stealing data, and developing malware that will do a variety of bad things to an organization's business systems, including locking them up. Victims of an attack will suffer extortion either to prevent its data from being exposed to the public or to unlock critical business systems. Sometimes victims experience both types of extortion or just one. The cost of, this, of entering this crime is far too low and the profits are still too high. As these attacks have evolved to more sophisticated enterprise-like operations involving multiple players, countering these efforts requires a multi-stakeholder approach. My testimony will offer a few thoughts on raising the cost of entry into this crime on the one hand and lowering the profitability of this crime on the other, on raising costs. Since the 2021 Colonial Pipeline attack, the private and public sectors raised the cost of committing this crime, but the barrier to entry still remains too low. Working with the private sector law enforcement around the world was able to disrupt notorious ransomware groups like Alpha V, Lockbit, Scattered Spider, to name a few. These public-private takedowns raise the cost, but to move the needle even further, the public and private sectors must double down on infrastructure and supply chain disruption and make equal effort on improving organizational resilience. There are three opportunities for disruption. First, disrupt the ability of crim criminal syndicates and affiliates from doing business with each other. Second, dis disrupt the infrastructure by targeting the criminal actor's ability to communicate with the victim or publicly disclose stolen data. Third, disrupt the payment distribution system by targeting intermediaries that support the vulnerable elements of the system. On lowering profits, ransomware attackers will want to cash out. The most vulnerable point in the payment system is where attackers must convert cryptocurrency into fiat or a victims must convert fiat into cryptocurrency. These transactions take place quickly. And in my experience, quick collaboration between money service businesses and law enforcement entities is key to exploiting the vulnerabilities caused by this conversion process. Now, although disruption is important, 
improving organizational awareness and resilience is equally as important. Cyber criminals who install ransomware use tried and true methods for access, methods that we know how to defend against. Encouraging organizations to prepare for the worst and improve their resilience will minimize downtime after an attack and make it easier for victims to recover from an attack without paying ransom. Several technology companies recommend several basic steps to identify and close off vulnerable entry points to not only make it more difficult for an attacker to get into an organization system, but to also improve organizational resilience such that if attacked, recovery is swift and downtime is minimal. These companies are also developing comprehensive solutions to combat ransomware attacks to cover every phase of the life cycle. These solutions range from attack prevention to malware detection to incident response and remediation. I am pleased to see that the US government, the security community, state and local governments, and the international community are coming together for a coordinated response to ransomware. Much work needs to be done, but I am optimistic that we have the leadership and ability to accomplish our goals. In conclusion, the Ransomware Task Force published a set of thoughtful and measured policy and operational recommendations, including several that require legislative action. Approximately half have been implemented, and I encourage all stakeholders involved to act where they can to reduce the incidence of ransomware attacks. Thank you to all of our witnesses for your opening testimonies. We'll now turn to member questions, and the chair recognizes myself for five minutes of questioning. Uh, first question to uh, Ms. Coven. Although ransomware attacks have existed for decades, they are now sometimes carried out using digital assets. So I want to ask for your perspective on the role that digital assets play in ransomware attacks and how can law enforcement and Congress work to combat ransomware? Thank you for your question. Yes, so cryptocurrency is a liquid, uh, instantaneous form of transport border payments, which has made it attractive to institutions and individuals for legitimate purposes. As with any new technology, there's always gonna be bad actors looking to exploit it and use it for malicious purposes. Um, as you've mentioned, ransomware existed prior to the existence of cryptocurrency, so have the threat actors involved in ransomware today. They were previously involved in banking, malware, and Trojans, harvesting financial credentials and accounts. Um, but in dealing with cryptocurrency, they've uh, incurred additional risk because of its traceability. We're no longer seeing ransom notes with the cryptocurrency address plastered on the front because that is an Achilles heel to these operations. And we have so many examples of law enforcement using this cryptocurrency address against them because from so a can single Can you talk about and describe the level of coordination required to respond to uh, the ransomware attacks. Can you talk about the coordination? Uh, f yes, from re reported incidents involving cryptocurrency addresses, law enforcement is able to understand the entire ransomware supply chain. We can understand the malware used, sometimes the access, and even where they launder their funds. It's an incredible lead to understanding these networks better and being able to disrupt not only where they cash out, but the other entities involved in the supply chain. Thank you. Ms. Steiper, where do you see ransomware trendings as AI and other emerging technologies become even more sophisticated than they are now? And how will these advancements be exploited by threat actors? And how can law enforcement leverage the same technologies to stop these actors? Thank you for the question, Vice Chairman. Um, in terms of where we see the direction of ransomware progressing, we at this time see AI as having limited impact, largely used to uh, scale up the ability to undertake phishing. Um, we do, though, have tremendous concern about the future of AI and the direction that it is uh, allowing criminal actors to potentially take, uh, uh, including making more sophisticated deep fakes and the like that ultimately form the first step in the chain of ransomware attacks. On the flip side, however, we also know that AI can be leveraged by some of the companies represented here and other members of the task force to boost cybersecurity defenses. That applies both to incident response and uh, digital forensics and firms, as well as uh, within networks um, by allowing 
organizations to better maintain their IT networks to identify when patches are disseminated, allow them to install the most essential patches first. Mm -hmm. But we also need to be quite vigilant as to the direction and shape of AI overall. And I think it's important that uh, we think about the overall governance of AI and the need for organizations leveraging these capabilities to consider both the positive impacts they can have on society as well as the detrimental impacts. Ultimately, we seek to see a more sustainable digital future, and that's one that requires a risk-based approach. Thank you. Mr. Sergile, the National Cybersecurity Alliance has said, when dealing with cybercrime, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of crime or a pound of cure. As policymakers, what should we do to highlight the need for adequate cybercrime prevention frameworks and education? So I, I actually use that, that statement with most of my customers, and mm -hmm. it, it's more about the preventative side of things, right? The bolstering, the, the shoring up of basics of a cybersecurity program. Part of the issue that we see within most organizations is as quickly as business is moving and as quickly as IT is moving, uh, some of the cyber hygiene or basics out of that um, are not there. From, uh, I'm more of a practitioner and more of a technologist, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the, the implications of just basic hygiene rather than policy. If you want to have a policy, uh, a discussion about policy, we have folks that, that can talk about policy as a whole. Um, what I will say is this, because of new technologies and how quickly we're implementing across the board, and in a lot of organizations there are attack surfaces being so poor and then not knowing about it, um, just I think concentrating on the, the foundational aspects of, of Thank you, Mr. Sorgo, and I hate to cut you off there, but uh, you can please uh, present your response, longer response in writing if you would like. Thank you so much, because my time's up. Uh, let me now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Ms. Beatty, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and again, to all the witnesses, thank you uh, for your detailed information and certainly your experiences. We figure out uh, how to tackle this issue. Uh, let me start with you, Ms. Walden. Uh, we certainly are all well aware of the recent ransomware attacks on large companies and name them. It could be Johnson's Control or MGM Resorts or Art and Health Services and the list goes on. But because of that, there seems to be some common misconception that cyber threat actors who commit ransomware attacks are more likely to target large companies and not small companies. Can you address this, and should small businesses uh, be concerned about ransomware uh, attacks? And give us your opinion on that. Thank you, Congresswoman Betty. Uh, yes, small and medium-sized businesses should be concerned about ransomware attacks. These criminal gangs are uh, using opportunity. They are really just looking to make a buck. And the best way to do that is to go for under-resourced uh, communities. So that's why you see ransomware attacks increasingly on schools, on hospitals, on public safety. These are opportunities for ransomware criminals to make a buck. And so helping small and medium businesses remain vigilant and resilient and aware and proactive, I think, is key to getting after the problem. Ms. Stifel, I see you nodding with that. Would you like to add, well, maybe I can just go down the row because now I see Mr. Sergal. Uh, quickly, is there anything that, how they may be impacted differently than the larger firms that you want to add to that? Thank you, Congressman Beatty. I would just echo uh, Ms. Walden's remarks that it is unfortunately often those who are uh, cyber poor who are targeted for these types of incidents. Uh, which oftentimes can drive these organizations out of business. And with small businesses being the lifeblood of the American economy, they do need additional support. Uh, there are some early term funds available through the Department of Homeland Security uh, and a grant program that, that uh, was established in late 2021. I would encourage Congress to su further support that uh, grant program and explore other avenues to uh, approach this community, which is essential to our Thank economy. you. 
Mr. Sarkow, because you also said we should work together and, and no, bipartisan. No, So in my past, I was the CISO for a regional bank, and I had to make the same choices that you're talking about. Do I go and invest uh, my funding into providing for my customers? Do I secure? And that's kind of the, the crux of the issue for a lot of organizations, because they have to make those hard decisions. And in that case, it very much goes to exactly what I was talking about earlier, about that foundational, that cyber hygiene, making sure that you have the core basics of a security program. There's a reason why we, mm -hmm. we call it concentric rings of protection or um, defense in depth. A lot of organizations don't have that, and they don't have the funding for technology. So in essence, what they end up doing is implementing, uh, for me, it was everything from uh, you know, FFIEC regulations uh, and dealing with the OCC and basically taking an audit-based approach. So you see that where they get audited and then they spend on that audit. I'm going to hate to cut you off, but my time in, I want to get to one more uh, question. Uh, and it was kind of triggered because Madam Chairperson asked us what could we do uh, differently or more through education. So let me ask it in this same way. What can we do in Congress, uh, specifically under the jurisdiction of this financial services uh, committee, to address this growing problem? We'll start with you, Ms. Walden. So for this committee under this jurisdiction, I think uh, perhaps tax credits incentivizing uh, smaller regional entities under this jurisdiction to adopt cybersecurity practices to be able to uh, integrate certain tools that are necessary to maybe do improved training and awareness, adopting a cyber, a plan, a cyber response plan, uh, grants, as uh, my colleague Ms. Staple mentioned, Grants that's attached to funding sure. is also a let me incentive. Let me ask just because I have about 30 seconds. Are there any legislative measures that we have on the table now or anything uh, that we should bring up? And I'm asking that, Madam Chair, because we're on such a good roll today uh, that we have witnesses who are nodding their heads. And maybe that's because Madam Chair and, and I are uh, co-chairing this that <laughs> we want to end on a good note. Uh, my, my time is up, but I, I just want, again want to say thank you. Submit in writing uh, because this is a historic moment for us uh, when we're doing all this state of the art uh, that we can make a difference and save small and large businesses. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Representative Barr, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, uh, Mr. Um, Sergerell, um, there is a shortage of cybersecurity professionals in the financial services sector uh, where they are desperately needed for reasons uh, being discussed today. We need more people like you uh, in our country. Uh, according to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the scarcity in cybersecurity talent in banking is one of the six priorities for protecting financial systems against cyber threats. Uh, the cybersecurity workforce is obviously paramount to the safety and soundness of the U.S. economy, and ultimately our national security and any shortages need to be addressed. Uh, do you agree that cybersecurity fa financial services workforce supply levels uh, is a problem, and what do we need to do to fix it? I uh, completely agree with you, and that's not only within financial services, that's cybersecurity in general, but uh, within the financial services side, I think continued partnership um, and education programs uh, such as the ones that we have at Palo Alto Networks. We have a Unit 42 Academy where we're able to train up people uh, to help fill those positions, as well as our Engineering Academy. Uh, Kemba has done a wonderful job with her time at the White House with the cyber workforce um, that we helped to sponsor as well. I think a lot of this uh, deals with, you know, if we look at the earliest times that people can get excited about cybersecurity or excited IT, it's going to be in that K, K through 12 period and the continued support of STEM programs uh, throughout the United States educational system will help with that as well. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Stiefel, um, uh, the Ransomware Task Force has done a comprehensive analysis of cyber insurance and ransomware. What do you believe are the biggest challenges facing the insurance industry when it comes to, to ransomware uh, coverage? Thank you for the question, Congressman. With regard to the biggest challenge uh, facing the insurance sector and, and cybersecurity, uh, at this point in time, our information is that not actually a very small percentage of the uh, marketplace actually has cyber insurance, which 
means that many of these organizations are not reached by the requirements to achieve, uh, in order to achieve insurance, meaning that we are more broadly very vulnerable across the ecosystem. The insurance industry can be a partner in raising national uh, cybersecurity resilience, um, but it, unfortunately many organizations aren't able to achieve, as I mentioned, insurance. So there are, um, I think, opportunities for the insurance sector to partner with a range of organizations to raise this level of cybersecurity in order to- Is that an issue of underwriting challenges? Um, is, there, is there actuarial uh, difficulties uh, in that? Or is it an affordability question for small, medium-sized uh, medium enterprises? Congressman, I'm not an insurance expert, but I would say it's a combination of the above. Um, unfortunately, our responses to manage ransomware and a range of cybersecurity risks are under uh, capitalized because we don't have sufficient information. So when you speak about actuarial tables, we don't have great data to back up some of the investments that need to be made in order to shore up our cybersecurity. Insurers can play a, an important role in that space. Um, but also I would recognize that it's a state-by-state -state basis um, where we need to then leverage all of this information across the ecosystem, both in the United States and with our partners and allies, to get the data that can drive adoption of better cybersecurity best practices and also inform policy decisions, including the ability to undertake disruptive efforts and resource. Well, well, I mean, obviously, for small businesses with modest cash on hand, affordability is a big problem here because, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they need that cash uh, week to week to keep their businesses alive. And if they're ransomed, uh, failure to pay could be an existential issue for those uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, so protecting American businesses is really important, and, and that's why we need to make uh, insurance available and affordable. But at the same time, I, I am curious if any of the uh, witnesses have thought about whether or not ransomware attackers take advantage of the fact that their victims actually have insurance coverage. And that's a, the flip side of that problem. Any thoughts on uh, the attractiveness of a target based on coverage? I'll chime in here. Thank you for your question. In our opinion, we actually see insurance as a driver of best practices in terms of security, defenses, a plan if and when attack. We actually attribute our decline in ransom payments in 2022 to more stringent insurance policies after a high year in 2021. Um, RUSI, a UK think tank, has also attributed insurance as a vehicle for um, supporting these best practices. I think insurance coverage is better than not having insurance coverage, um, but we need to think through these um, these problems, these questions, and, and um, obviously a more robust insurance marketplace to protect our country is important. With that, I yield. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize the gentlelady from California, Ranking Member Ms. Waters. Um, thank you, Chair Lady. Uh, before I um, begin my questions, I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege uh, to recognize one of our witnesses here today, Ms. Kimba Ennis uh, Walden, who is one of America's foremost experts on cybersecurity, and particularly this issue of ransomware. She also happens to be someone I've known for decades. Back when she was but a child living with her family in the Bahamas, her father, Dr. Justin Frazier Ennis, served as the American, at the American ambassador when my husband, uh, Sidney Williams, was the United States ambassador to that nation. Uh, in the decades since, Sidney and I have continued our close relationship with the Ennis family, including Marchetta, Kevin's mother, and it is why I'm very personally very pleased to see Ms. Walden on the panel today, and I extend my welcome to her, and thank you, Chair Lady, for allowing me the time. And with that, I will go right to uh, a question that I have for uh, Ms. Walden. Um, Ms. Walden, I'd like to discuss the ransom payments uh, that public and private sector victims make to ransomware threat actors. It seems sad. Uh, it's been said that there is one reliable way to end ransomware altogether, and that's to starve the criminals of their proceeds. 
This is why some cyber security and national security experts have recommended that Congress ban ransom payments altogether, perhaps with limited exceptions for situations that have national security implications. Others, although, have pointed out that to do so would mean risking not only those affected by the failure to bring their business operations back online, but that it would cause the attacks to focus on critical infrastructure, meaning those organizations that we can least afford to lose, like 911 systems, schools, power plants, and banks. Could you please discuss the benefits and detriments of banning ransomware payments, and what, in your opinion, uh, how, how, would this, how should this issue be handled? Well, thank you so much, and it's lovely to see you, Congresswoman Waters. Uh, to answer your question, I am a part of the Ransomware Task Force, and we recently issued an open letter explaining the, the pathway to a ransomware ban for payments. As I explained earlier, the profits are still too high and the costs are still too low, so we need to shift that balance, and there are a number of policy options that we can take in order to get to the point where profitability is no longer a motivator for ransomware actors. I know this, if we banned ransomware payments today, we could bankrupt the very small and medium-sized businesses that the American economy relies upon. Think rural hospitals that serve four or five municipalities, those can go bankrupt. What we need to do is prepare for the worst, prepare those organizations to be more resilient against a ransomware attack, because a ban on payments is not gonna stop the attacks from happening, but it will, it will starve those businesses. So, in that vein, do what we can to make sure that those critical infrastructure entities are prepared to be able to bounce back. Ransomware actors will exploit the downtime that it takes for a company or an entity to come back online and cause more pressure for about paying, right? So the MGMs of the world can withstand the downtime and not pay. Um, but your small local hospital or your local uh, school system may have a bit more difficult time. So we need to focus on resilience in order to be able to achieve the ransomware payment ban that, that we do need to have. Thank you. Um, have you seen or heard about uh, ransomware uh, when our national security was at stake? What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's never fun. So here's... Here's the good news. President Biden, at the beginning of the administration, declared ransomware a national security concern, which galvanized the global security community around getting after the problem. We have ransomware actors that are protected in safe havens around the world. Uh, the four countries of concern come to mind immediately, Russia, North Korea, Iran. So, and, uh, so we need to be able to work together in order to make sure that these ransomware criminal gangs are not operating with impunity and doing the country of concerns bidding for them. But it does take a global effort. It is, it is not fun to withstand ransomware attacks. As so there effort. are some instances uh, that we must do what we must do in order to protect the national security. And uh, we must recognize that uh, when we talk about should we or should we not pay up. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank and you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Waters. I would now I'd like to recognize gentlemen from Georgia, Mr. Laudermilk, for five minutes of your questioning. Oh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thanks to all of our witnesses for uh, being here and testifying today. Th three years ago this month, a ransomware gang gained access to an unused VPN account belonging to the Colonial Pipeline Company operated out of Alpharetta, Georgia. Using this account, they were able to exploit the company's trust in that account, exfiltrate and encrypt data, and ransom it back to the company for millions of dollars. Luckily, the company was able to cut off the hacker's access to downstream systems to protect the pipeline infrastructure but in doing so caused a major disruption to the flow of oil in the eastern United States. While security professionals and law enforcement are still analyzing the attack, the chain of events highlighted a cross-sectional 
a cross-sectoral cybersecurity vulnerability, which is trust. Um, Ms. Stifel, the same year that the high-profile colonial pipeline attack happened, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network received a number of ransomware-related BSA filings worth approximately $1.2 billion. This was a 188% increase over the previous year's total. While the latest data isn't available yet, I'm concerned by the trend apparent in the data that we have. Ms. Stifel, are you aware of this trend more broadly, and do you think it's driven by a real increase in the number of ransomware attacks, or is it improved reporting, or both? Thank you for the question, Congressman. I do think it's a combination of the above. Um, we do, as I was saying in my remarks, we need information to drive our ability to disrupt this business model. Right. And so it's critical that organizations that are victims of ransomware incidents report that information. It's also critical that those who have visibility on ransomware payments, which doesn't only, is not only limited to those have, who have to file uh, under the Bank Secrecy Act, that they share information and have protections to share information so that we can bring all of the capabilities that we have in both public and private sector to this question. I also think that, as we've seen with uh, extortionate moves to leverage reporting requirements, some threat actors are uh, encouraging organizations, perhaps, uh, to ensure that they do report. We've seen some, some uh, tactics of that nature. So I think it all is also the case that organizations are, more organizations are coming forward to report those incidents out of fear that uh, their data may become available on a leak site and they will not get ahead of the message. But again, I think this comes back to the question of resourcing and the ability for departments and agencies who receive this information to leverage that information to the fullest extent, including by partnering with the private sector to undertake disruption. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Sergio, um, to address trust as a vulnerability, many companies have pivoted or, or are pivoting to zero trust architectures. At a high level, could you explain how this actually works? Absolutely, and, and first and foremost, uh, Mr. Loudermilk, uh, as a growing up in Roswell and currently a resident coming. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so if, if we take a look at the way that, that cybersecurity from a, we started off with trust but verify, and then within the financial institutions, you have this wonderful concept of four eyes principle when you're looking at certain things. Zero trust in its essence is you don't trust anybody or anything that's on your network and you need to verify everything that has access into your network. What that allows to do is basically work together across the totality of your, your infrastructure. So uh, your identity, your, your device, your network, your internet, being able to pull those all together and verify along the way that you are, supposed to be, you are who you are on what you're supposed to be to get to what you need. Okay. That's the short answer. After spending uh, 30 years uh, in the, the uh, IT sector, one of the uh, things that uh, rules that we live by was not uh, if you were going to be hacked, but when you were going to be hacked. And to build a secure network based on your risk. I remember I worked for Honeywell Federal Systems and they built a network that was totally secure, but it was so slow no one could use it. Yeah. Considering the risk factor though, do you think that uh, financial service firms are more susceptible to, to breach than non-financial service firms? At the end of the day, it really comes down to what the threat actor is looking for, right? If nation states typically are looking for advantage or a way that they can leverage something from you. Those that are looking for financial gain will go after where the money is. And in this case, it's going to be a financial services form, uh, firm. Um, across the board, there are certain things that I see, and I have the dubious honor of, of or the dubious distinction of having been on the largest breaches in the last 18 months. What I can say across the board, what I see in breaches is four core principles. One is lack of segmentation. So it's wide open for threat actors to come across and, and a few other factors. All right, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Let me now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Nickel, for thank, five minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. Small and medium-sized businesses, including financial institutions, fall prey to ransomware attacks yearly. These attacks can drive companies into bankruptcy and threaten our national security. We need to find bipartisan solutions that equip businesses with the tools and knowledge to safeguard themselves and their customers. It's a common misconception that when cryptocurrency is used as a ransomware payment, these transactions are completely anonymous and untraceable. 
However, the transparency of the blockchain is actually used to investigate and disrupt ransomware attacks. Uh, first question for you, Ms. Coven. Can you explain how that works? Yes, thank you for your question. So sometimes investigators will use Chainalysis proprietary data, but also the reporting mechanism of these victims, and we have to encourage these victims to report as quickly as possible because laundering the cryptocurrency can take anywhere from, from minutes to hours. Um, and basically, law enforcement can trace these funds to cryptocurrency exchanges where they will have KYC information and able to identify and disrupt. But really, speed and training and resourcing is really necessary to equip law enforcement entities around the United States and around the world to be able to react quickly. Th thanks so much. Ne next set of questions to you, Ms. Walden. Um, based on your experience, do many organizations still have a long way to go to better protect their, their businesses from ransomware and other cyber attacks? And, and what are the key components of a cybersecurity program a company should incorporate into that framework? Thank you for your question. Uh, so yes, a lot of companies, a lot of entities, state and local governments, all of it, need to do more in order to protect themselves and prevent uh, ransomware and criminal actors from getting into their systems in the first place. So I have some very basic tried and true methods. Uh, one is to know your assets, to know your network, understand where your crown jewels are to protect them well using those zero trust principles. Uh, another is to deploy multi-factor authentication. It is still a thing uh, that we need to be able to be able to identify how to do that. Um, the third, I would say, would be to patch, patch, and patch again. Uh, it turns out that there are a handful, maybe a few dozens of vulnerabilities that exist for where there's a patch that exists uh, that still are vulnerabilities and that remain unpatched. That CISA's known exploited vulnerabilities list in catalog is a great place to start. Training and education and good governance would be my fourth. Uh, so an entire enterprise needs to be trained at some level, some more than others. The CISO needs to know what the CISO needs to know, but the line worker needs to understand a bit of security as well. The entire enterprise has to be well informed about security practices. Uh, those would, and then when to help incident responders, uh, those incident responders will need to know who's in charge and to make decisions. Uh, so you need to have a plan and to practice that plan on a regular basis. And then my final thing, and I promise, would be uh, ransomware actors are now not just locking up critical business systems and stealing data, but they're locking up backups. And we've been telling enterprises appropriately to back systems up. Uh, but now we have to be very specific. Those backups should be offline and off-premises. Thanks. And, and Ms. Walden, uh, ransomware payments in 2023 surpassed the billion dollar mark. We've heard that already increasing nearly tenfold from 102 million in 2018. Why do you see that happening? I think there are a number of reasons. One, ransomware criminals. Uh, uh, operate with impunity without much uh, consequence in certain countries of concern that I mentioned earlier, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. Uh, the other is that the demands are actually higher. So there may be, the, the, the number of payments are reduced, but the dollar value is higher. We see ransomware actors going after um, the most uh, willing participants to pay the high prices. Uh, and a lot of companies don't have the, the resources to withstand the kind of downtime that locking up a backup, for example, would, would cause. And, and I'm running out of time, but, but where, where should Congress be focused to try and prevent these uh, ransomware attacks? I think there are a number of things. One, we need to really focus on how do we get to a place where the American economy is resilient enough to withstand a, pan a ransomware ban, payment ban. That's the North Star, but there are some real steps have to be taken because ultimately we need to protect the American economy, the American people. Uh, so that's one. Two, uh, we need to be able to allow certain uh, intermediaries in the payment system to be able to share information laterally and with law enforcement to be able to stop the process. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Let me now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, for five minutes of your questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, ransomware attacks were first seen in the late 1980s, but they've become more and more common as we know uh, today. I'm a small business owner in Texas, and I can tell you small business, we're talking about, and Main Street are getting hammered. 
uh, by this, and, and it's uh, devastating. These kinds of attacks uh, started off fairly simple. An individual would click on a, fa a fake link, and their computer would be locked down by the attacker then, until they paid the attacker, uh, hacker attacker, a small amount of money or a sum of money. Now, recently, these attacks have become uh, much more sophisticated by using new technologies like artificial intelligence and are able to go unnoticed by law enforcement. As quickly as technology is evolving around the world, we must uh, stay up to date on the most advanced ways that technology is being used for illegal activity and stay ahead of the curve in our defense against these bad actors. Uh, so, Mr. Sergio, could you expand on how ransomware attacks have evolved over the years and what can this committee and Congress do to keep up with that evolution and best counter these attacks? Thanks for the question. Uh, to start off, you're absolutely right. What we're seeing across the board is the, is the speed, scale, and sophistication of the attackers is increasing in, in monumental uh, increments um, to the point where uh, Megan was talking earlier about artificial intelligence being used by threat actors. We're seeing that as well. The one way that we are able to combat that is by using artificial intelligence ourselves to be able to kind of clear through the clutter and be able to respond automatically. So uh, in one instance, uh, which was a breach back in February, was the first time that we saw AI being used in an active attack. Um, a very well-skilled and well-tooled SOC of 20 was not able to keep pace and parity, but with, with tooling that has machine learning and artificial intelligence, we can absolutely keep pace and parity, knock down the alert fatigue that we see on a regular basis, because that's part of the problem. Uh, critical alerts go missed. So uh, fighting fire with fire is, is a simple answer. It's like any other bad guy, they're always ahead of you one step. That's good. Well, the, the, the kind of silver lining in this is their use of machine learning and AI is actually a generation or two behind us. We first kind of saw the, the first implementation of a GPT uh, for threat actors back in March of 23 with HackGPT. Now I think we have eight different types of AI tooling for threat actors, uh, but it's a concept of good data and being able to cleanse that data, and they don't have that at this point. Yeah. But if they do come together, that's going to be a different story. So we've seen an increase in ransomware attacks on individual Americans. We talked about that. We know that. But also large multinational companies like attacks we see and saw on MGM and Caesars. Uh, the payouts for these large attacks have grown in scale, driving the attackers uh, to target more and more high-profile victims. These bad actors are going after companies across all industries, from healthcare companies to refined pro uh, product pipelines, and uh, which is showing how protection against ransomware is becoming a necessity for our national security. It's a big expense on small businesses to protect themselves. In order for us to best protect uh, everyone, the United States must have safety and security measures in place should there be an attack on key infrastructure in the United States. So, Ms. Coven, could you elaborate on the national security risks that large-scale ransomware attacks pose? Thank you for your question. And we certainly do see the, uh, the phenomena of big game hunting, large entities being targeted by ransomware operators in our data set. As much as 75% of the overall ransomware payments we've seen are uh, comprised of payments of a million dollars or more. So these actors are becoming more sophisticated using dark net market resources uh, that they can buy and sell. But luckily, we can track those purchases, and those are a great identifier in enabling us to disrupt. Now, we have, it's come up earlier, we have noted uh, nation state actors engaged in ransomware from China, Russia, Iran, and they're um, testing ransomware, uh, not only for financially motivated activity, but we are seeing ransomware used to obfuscate nationally, politically motivated activities like disruption and espionage. So it's so important that we involve multiple agencies with every lens of visibility available to us, following the money, following the tooling, the infrastructure, and the people. Okay, thank you, and uh, I yield my time back. Thank you. I now recognize the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Peterson, for five minutes of your questioning. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you all for this uh, discussion today. I was, uh, I had a lot of things that kept me up at night before coming to Congress, and you can definitely add this to my list. Uh, I was astonished to learn about the increase just from 2018 on ransomware. It went up to $1.1 billion. 
It is uh, moving in the right direction, as you've noted, Ms. Cohen, about a 15% decrease in payments with, with uh, people being able to be better prepared. Um, something that was highlighted during the testimony, uh, Ms. Stiefel, about how we need to invest in the legal and investigative capacity. What does that look like? I know that that is difficult when we have our adversaries internationally uh, who are unfortunately not being held accountable. What should we consider for specific steps here in Congress to support that work? And then I um, want to open it up to you, Ms. Walden, as well about additional steps we can do to put pressure on uh, Iran and China and Russia when they're engaging in this. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. So in terms of resourcing, uh, we're looking particularly at agencies who have investigative and enforcement authority within the committee's jurisdiction, obviously, that the agencies at the Department of Treasury, but they work hand in hand with other elements of the U.S. government. So uh, with respect to the number of SAR reports that were mentioned earlier, all of these reports are coming into the government. They're being disseminated to a handful, a small number of departments and agencies. There are a lot of reports. Uh, and as has been said before in prior testimony to the committee, a suspicious activity report doesn't mean illicit activity, but we have to look at all of the, the information. Unfortunately, um, there is a shortage, as we've heard today in testimony, of capable workforce. That also applies to investigators. It does take a higher degree of understanding to put the pieces together, to leverage capabilities that some of the witnesses have, um, to bring greater light to the activity that's being undertaken, both by whom and the tactics, techniques, and procedures that they're leveraging. Um, so that means that we need to also have uh, officers, special, uh, supervisory special agents and the like over at the FBI in the, the Secret Service, also in Treasury, who understand, have the training necessary to understand how to leverage what is available. I think it's also important, though, to look at ways that we can uh, incentivize companies to report, but also make sure that we're breaking down the barriers, limiting the ability for the government to, to partner with private sector partners to build a more holistic picture and leverage each entity, both public and private's capabilities, to reduce the ability for these threat actors to maintain access to our networks. Certain actors in the ecosystem, public sector and private sector entities, have the ability to frustrate their ability to continue to operate. We don't see the incentives being in the right place right now, and we do think there's an opportunity for Congress to clarify. Thank you. And Ms. Walden, if you have a follow-up on what we can do uh, to put pressure on, on countries that are engaging in this. Absolutely. So, you know, I think what the FBI in particular has been doing is been naming and shaming the FBI in, com in combination with DOJ and indicting, even though these threat actors remain in safe haven spaces. Um, then they were able to work with law enforcement across the world to be able to grab folks, because ransomware actors, just like the rest of us, like to take vacation, for example, um, don't necessarily want to stay in their home agency or their home country. So that would be one. Other would be, another would be diplomatic efforts, uh, not something that necessarily Congress can do, but something that we have to continue to engage on. Um, there was one opportunity, it was thinly veiled, I admit, but you know, we, we had some Chinese nationals that were apprehended by Chinese authorities. We had some, like I think it was our evil, some ransomware criminal actors that were apprehended by Russian authorities. Um, again, not perfect. But these are opportunities that we can continue to capitalize on. And I would echo what Ms. Stifel said. In, in expanding the ability for the IRS, the Secret Service, Homeland Security Investigations, FBI, to be able to understand signals that are available from large technology, technology companies and cloud service providers and understand the signals that are available from blockchain analysis and the forensics to be able to access and review SAR reports and put the whole picture together really tremendously improves law enforcement's ability to get after these threat actors. Thank you very much. I also wanted to ask all of you, and now I'm running out of time, but how do we, how can we as members of Congress engage our local municipalities, our businesses, and give them the information that they need to protect themselves and have those precautions in place? I can take a quick stab. I'm sure everybody has something to say. Um, the first is awareness is improved, but we need to be proactively going out to local municipalities. Sorry, now I'm out of time. I should have asked that. But yeah, we need more time. I apologize. Let me now recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Zach Nunn. 
Well, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. I want to thank the panel for being here. I think this is incredibly important on a bipartisan level to be able to both understand not only the threat, but talk about some real solutions behind this. I know each of you have worked in this in a really incredible way. We all know that with each passing day, our adversaries are continuing to shift their dominance, particularly in the cyberspace. And the threat posed is not just from state actors, it's down to criminal elements, lone wolf actors, as well as some really advanced technology like artificial intelligence that's starting to play in this space. In the last three years alone, we've seen a 15% increase in ransomware. And for the average you know, main business, that's a $4 million chunk out of your paycheck, which means that it has a trickle-down effect on the entire economy. This is a billion dollar problem that we're addressing, and that's just starting with what's happening right now. Look, as a former counterintelligence officer, and I've had the privilege of working with some of you in this uh, realm before, we have to address the threat as it continues to evolve. And one of those things is looking at groups, Madam Chairwoman, like Volt Typhoon, coming out of the communist element within China, where they've offloaded into a proxy element the ability to go after this while holding themselves not accountable for their bad actors. The truth of cyber warfare is when it's rooted in the idea that it, this is a situation of a when this attack occurs, not if this attack occurs, and we have to be an all hands on deck approach to it. So with it, I want to um, highlight some of the things that we are trying to address, uh, and I appreciate those of you who have helped weigh in on our Public and Private Ransomware Response Coordination Act to address some of the issues we're coming up with today. So I'd like to get into it. Um, you know. Megan, we've gotten to work together before, but Ms. Ms. Stuffel, one of the things I want to talk about first is share with us a little bit about ransomware as a service, uh, the background on how this is and how it really empowers people with a very minimal level skill set to perpetrate something that's very dangerous to all of us. Thank you for the question, Congressman, and for your ongoing service to the country. Um, ransomware as a service as a business model has become a major problem in this space. As Ms. Walden identified, it is far too easy for someone with very little capability to be able to procure, oftentimes on the dark web, the, uh, a set of capabilities that allows them uh, to leverage access, in many cases, that someone else has obtained in a network to deploy a, a, ransom, a set of malware that has probably been developed by yet a, a third person. So we have, uh, it's almost like a spider web where you have different actors who, many of whom may not have much sophistication, piecing together uh, the number of vulnerabilities that are uh, resident in our ecosystem in order to have an outsized impact on our economy. Many cases, these actors don't know each other, but as Ms. Walden also identified, they do communicate with each other. So we need to be able to facilitate access to all of the information that both public and private sector have on these threat actors' communications in order to begin to better prepare ourselves to take action. Um, the ransomware as a service business model also leverages capabilities in cloud service providers and other types of bulletproof hosters. Many of these bulletproof hosters are in jurisdictions outside uh, our reach, so to speak. Nonetheless, though, those jurisdictions are partners uh, and may have relationships with some of our partners. I think about the Counter Ransomware Initiative, which has now grown to over 50 countries and organizations. This collective effort could be a great tool to leverage with appropriate resources uh, the ability to take and put pressure on these threat actors who are living in safe havens. And so I think there's an opportunity there for Congress to consider resourcing, uh, as I've been saying, departments and agencies to boost our support to our counter ransomware initiative peers yeah. to begin to extend our net overseas. Fully agree on this. Thank you both for your work in this area. One of the things I want to highlight here is that those who are on the front line, and Ms. Burns, I'm going to come to you next here, is that it's our private sector folks around the world who are addressing this. In my home district of Iowa, public schools got hit with ransomware. That as soon as one was hit, they used that same technique to hit the next one, and the next one, and the next one, to a point where not only is it costing taxpayers money, we're breaching critical information about our kids. Look, in this bill, we're focused on threat detection, rate of information sharing, response time, and threat suppression. Talk to us a little bit about, in your experience, how partnerships like that can really help learn from the private sector to help the public sector. Thank you for your question. I, information sharing is so critical in these spaces in, in getting information to law enforcement to identify, track these payments and disrupt them, but also to prevent future victims from falling prey to attack. In my experience, the best public-private sector collaborations have involved dynamic bi-directional sharing. It sounds 
simple, but it is radical for some of agencies to engage in this culturally different practice. And we've had stunning successes. We've been able to freeze North Korean stolen funds, ransomware payments from the Colonial Pipeline because of the collaboration. Thank you, Madam Chair. My time has Thank expired. You. I appreciate the work that all of you are doing in this field. Thank you. Ms. Coben, feel free to submit elaborative uh, response in writing if you like. I'd now like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us. As several of you have noted, the starting point in Zero Trust is a secure digital identity that identifies all participants uh, who are active on your internal network. And it strikes me that the single uh, most useful thing that we in Congress can do is to establish a federally recognized standard for presenting a legally traceable identity like a digital driver's license or digital passport or something like that. And I've been working on that, and I appreciate your endorsement. Is there anyone that thinks that's not a useful contribution to, to cybersecurity generally? All right. Well, thank you for not um, objecting to that. I think it's a, it should be a no-brainer, and I'm disappointed that we haven't done this um, many years ago. Now, Mr. Sergile, in your testimony, you note that AI is providing scammers with new tools that they can use for social engineering and ransomware more broadly. Your company is also using AI to improve companies' ability to respond to cyber attacks. So it appears like we're really entering an arms race here. Now, ransomware is only one tool that bad actors use to exploit uh, vulnerabilities of a firm. Um, uh, the it was 60 Minutes last week reported uh, pure social engineering hacks of, um, of the casinos in Las Vegas, which were very disruptive. And now with deepfake impersonations, we're starting to see instances where an attacker does not even need to gain access to a network to be successful. Now, last year, an employee of a Hong Kong-based financial firm was tricked into wiring $25 million to a scammer following a Zoom meeting with his management, and it turns out that everyone on that Zoom was a deep fake impersonation and the money was stolen without any actual breach of the company's internal systems. So there are two trains of thoughts about dealing with these deep fakes. Uh, the first one is uh, to imagine developing systems to automatically detect deep fakes, um, which I personally think is gonna be a losing game over time. The other one is simply to look at the other side of the coin and say we have, you have to, um, every citizen who wishes should have a way of proving they are who they say they are online uh, by presenting a, a digital ID of some kind. Um, and you know, several states have already issued uh, mobile driver's licenses. The technologies in every one of our cell phones, um, the basic technology and protocols were developed at NIST almost a decade ago now. Um, and in, you know, places like the EU and India and elsewhere are already rolling out digital ID systems and they're very effective at, at uh, you know, providing really high quality two-factor authentication. So uh, first off, um, do you believe that a digital ID system as is being implemented in other countries would uh, be useful in presenting, in, in preventing at least the social engineering um, things? Where? You know, so a couple things about that. I, I stated earlier, I'm, I'm very much a technologist. I'm not a policy uh, person myself, and we have a team for that that I can put you in contact with. What I will say about a digital ID, just like any other type of technology, it's not going to be infallible. Uh, if you take a look at technologies as a whole, um, it may be. What I explain to folks is that at a point in time, every, there's going to be a point in time where it's 100% secure, and that might change from from the next second to the next minute to the next hour or days. Um, I, my only kind of apprehension as a technologist would be that could it possibly be hacked and I don't know enough about it to, to give a definitive either way. I tend to be a skeptic because of the industry that I'm in. Yeah, well the, you know, these systems rely on trusting the silicon in your cell phone. Your biometric login is the, the core of it that yeah. associating your real ID license with your the silicon in your cell phone with you and trusting its, its um, biometric login but I think that's probably about the best you can do uh, for to, to ensure it and I think the fact that we haven't that we developed these standards uh, there are technology and we are not implementing them as a country is uh, you know it, it's a tragedy that's driving a lot of a lot of the criminal the success of the criminal gangs that we're seeing here um, 
another, you mentioned also, uh, and actually, well, maybe you have experience in this. When you're, you're training AIs on ransomware response, um, is there a, a data set that you'd really like to get your hands on? It, you know, like if you had a data set of all of, the, all of the successful and unsuccessful responses to ransomware, is that something that would really be useful if the government can provide that on some confidential basis? In one word, yes, that would be quite useful. However, we don't have great measurements. We don't have great data uh, because it's not, and until CERCIA was passed, it's not uh, required. You can't manage what you don't know, mm -hmm. but yeah. yes. Yeah, well, that's, if you have any ideas on, on what useful data sets the federal government can make. Thank you. Available. The Thank gentleman's you. time's back. up. Uh, I'd like to now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, for your five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you to our witnesses. So uh, in Pennsylvania alone, a loss of $360 million to cyber threats, as the data states, and over 16,000 complaints in 2023 alone, according to the FBI Internet Crime Report, uh, they are very often devastating attacks. Um, a business within my district uh, recently told us that uh, they fear for small businesses that aren't equipped and tech savvy and do not have the proper IT infrastructure. Um, and the same company is spending 20 to 30% more on IT uh, to protect themselves, uh, costing more than a million dollars a year additional. So it's, it's a big deal. Um, and then meanwhile, just on the, on the tax side of things, I, I can't help but say that we, we need to uh, look after small businesses with bonus depreciation and R&D tax credits and the small business tax, tax cut, which was passed in the House and for whatever reason is languishing in the, in the Senate. But we just need to be far more serious about, about these threats and the additional uh, crises and, and, uh, uh, that our small businesses and large businesses as well face. So, uh, uh, Ms. Stifel, may I uh, start with you? Small, medium-sized companies, what can they do to better prepare and ward off uh, such a cyber attack uh, and, and deter cyber attacks? And what, what, what companies are more vulnerable? What industries? And what makes, one, what makes uh, these ransomware uh, uh, groups attack one company over another? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. I agree with you that small businesses need a tremendous amount of support, and the ways that they can protect themselves are a fewfold. Uh, the first, as I was mentioning and is in my written testimony, unfortunately, we have an ecosystem that's riddled with insecure technologies. So we need to move and shift security left. We need to have an ecosystem dominated by secure by design technologies. Until then, we are only taking holding measures. Uh, so that means that small businesses need to, if they can, leverage the resources of experts. If they can't, there are um, more secure uh, operating systems than others, and, and I won't name names. Um, but leveraging, uh, doing a bit of research and leveraging those more secure systems uh, would be the first step. As Ms. Walden mentioned, um, they need to know what's on their network. Um, the first thing, as Ms. Walden also said, you can't defend what you don't know, but looking at it, there are basically five simple steps. Know what you have, making sure that your systems are up to date, using multi-factor authentication, backing up your data, and another one that we haven't talked about yet is using um, uh, uh, protective DNS service, which essentially blocks uh, users from going to malicious websites. These are free resources in many cases. Um, uh, my prior nonprofit, the Global Cyber Alliance, has a resource for small businesses, and that's also supported uh, by MasterCard. So being aware and leveraging what's out there is a first step. Yeah. Um, we also, though, need to think about other ways to help small businesses, and I think it was raised, the idea of looking at tax incentives um, there are also grants that are, have been made available most recently in the past, passed in late 2021 and 2022. Uh, those grant programs should be examined, looked for measures of impact, and we're successful, and I think that they will be in raising our overall collective resilience. There's an opportunity for Congress to continue to support those grant programs to help small businesses boost their hygiene. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sergil? Uh, it, it, tell us something about the cyber insurance. Is, uh, is it getting more competitive? Is it affordable for small to medium-sized business? Um, so cyber insurance as a whole, right? Uh, we deal with it on a regular basis. We, we actually partner with, with cyber insurance from a proactive standpoint. 
I can tell you, having been a practitioner and what I used to go through to, to acquire cyber insurance, it's dramatically different today. And I think a lot of that had to do with uh, newcomers into the cyber insurance world and the amount of tax that have happened, especially with everybody going home with COVID. Um, used to be, you could fill out a, a spreadsheet and they would tell you what your, what your uh, premiums were. Now, uh, it's, it's a lot more detailed where uh, audits will happen, the, the amount that you spend versus the uh, benefits or the coverage that you get has dramatically changed. Sure. Um, and we're also seeing some insurance uh, organizations uh, not basically dealing with the nation state attacks in, in different ways to include Thanks. clauses. Thanks, I'm, I'm, I'm almost out of time already. Uh, regarding the 60 minutes that was brought up and, and Russia and some of these crime organizations existing there. If you have any thoughts for what Congress can do to sanction those, we'd appreciate it. I yield back, Madam Chair. I would like to recognize the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Della Cruz, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, witnesses, for being here today. There were several things that stood out to me, um, mostly as a small business owner myself, and I think that education and bringing awareness is certainly key, starting with a hearing just like this. And there was something that Mrs. Uh, Stiefel said that actually in intrigued me, because as a small business owner, we don't have the resources that the larger banks or the larger companies do. And many times, you're working 10, 12-hour shifts in your business just to put food on the table. So they might not be watching C-SPAN right now to listen to this really exciting hearing, right? So I think that you mentioned many tools, but one that stood out to me was even giving tax incentives because something that a small business owner certainly does pay attention to is their taxes. And when they can um, take advantage of a, a tax incentive, that actually brings to light what importance this has. Do you have any further information or have any specifics on that? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. We do think uh, it was a recommendation from the early days of our task force report that tax incentives be explored. Um, and so we'd be happy to get back to you on that question. I think it's uh, important to ensure that uh, small businesses have uh, the opportunity to really understand the capabilities um, and the qualifications of an organization that might be essentially selling them services that they might use this tax incentive to procure. We would want to make sure that um, the system that's developed to support that tax incentive base be um, a, an ounce of prevention and not a greater problem, but we're happy to get back to you on that. Excellent. Thank you. And I see Ms. Walden shaking her head that yes. Share your thoughts with us, please. Uh, I completely agree. Just to add a bit of value on top of what Ms. Stiefel said, I think the State of Maryland Institute has some a, a tax credit uh, that they're reevaluating and assessing to see the impact of it, but that might be a good place to start for some ideas. But small businesses, like you said, have very thin margins, and we need to be a little bit more proactive for incentives, incent finding incentives. Well, as I, as I listened to my colleague who said, uh, what can we do? Ms. Pedersen asked a little bit ago, what can we do as legislators, right? We can hold this hearing, but the reality is a small business owner is probably not watching right now. And so I think that exploring the tax part of it is something that as legislators, we would be able to look at as a bipartisan measure at the you know, at the suggestion from, from both of you. So thank you so much for your input there. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Sergile, are there benefits in engaging in negotiations with the threat actors to drive down payments? So if you take a look at uh, Unit 42 last year dealt, out of all their cases, 75% of them were ransomware. and. I would say in a majority of those cases, there was some kind of ransom asked for or some kind of payment asked for. The only benefit, so there's a couple different benefits to discussing with, with ransomware actors. Um, one is to elongate uh, the time that it takes to understand how impactful that breach is. Secondarily, it's also a mechanism that we use 
to be able to ensure that we have the right tools for the customer, such as their backups, where we can recover from that without having to make a payment. So we use ransomware negotiations in, in a couple different ways, and it's purely based on the situation on the ground. Thank you. And lastly, um, Ms. Stiefel, how do cyber insurance policies affect the ways uh, in which victim organizations respond to ransomware attacks? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, the impact that insurers can have is, are a fewfold. First, uh, most insurers now it's, uh, require a baseline set of capabilities, cybersecurity hygiene practices by their insureds in order to qualify for coverage. As part of that coverage, they will most likely require them to develop an incident response plan, but they will also identify for these uh, vic their insureds uh, firms that they should leverage in the event of an incident. And um, in many cases, uh, as was just mentioned, those firms also, uh, incident response firms also work with negotiators. Uh, one of the things I'd like to add in working with a negotiator is it also buys time for law enforcement to develop a response plan as well in working with the victim to come back after these actors. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you very much. Seeing no other members in the room, that concludes our member questioning. And I'd like to thank all of you for your testimony and answering all of our questions today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for your response. And I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as possible. And with that, this hearing is now adjourned.